clearly provoked a war against Denmark. The result? Victory. Two years later, against Austria. Result, another victory. And four years later, the great test against France. An amazed world stood by as Prussia, until then a minor power, dared to challenge the strongest nation in Europe. Result, another victory. This was the moment of triumph that changed the history of the world. The Prussian dream of conquest was no longer a dream. The German princes saw the Prussian eagle soaring triumphant in the European sky. Now they clambered on the bandwagon and united under Prussian leadership to form the German Empire. And in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, heart of defeated France, Bismarck saw his Prussian king crowned German emperor, absolute monarch of a new empire founded on blood iron and conquest. Its symbol, Victoria, emblem of victory. Not the Liberty Bell, not the Magna Carta, not Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, not any symbol of freedom, but Victoria, the symbol of conquest. Thus, Prussia had created Germany, and the myth of Prussian superiority had become the myth of the master race. And if the Carl Schmidt of that generation had any worries about the liberties that had been denied him, they were now forgotten. In this moment of triumph, just to be a German was enough. In the newly created Reich, industry flourished as never before. The merchant fleet grew larger every day. German harbors were jammed with commerce, and German stomachs filled with beer and sausage. Germany had achieved unity, become rich, no other country threatened her. The world hoped for a peaceful good neighbor. But the world had forgotten the Prussian tradition that Germany had inherited. A tradition not of peace and friendship, but of war and conquest. And by now, Carl Schmidt of the second generation, the father of the Carl Schmidt we had to fight, was arrogantly singing, Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, Germany, Germany overall, as he proudly watched his fatherland becoming the most aggressively nationalistic country in the world. Industry was carefully controlled to accord with the policies of the great general staff. For in the new Reich, Bismarck had added a fourth pillar to the structure of the warlike state. Frederick's militarists, landowners, and state officials had been joined by the big industrialists. A gigantic railroad system was laid out, more according to strategic war plans than the necessities of peacetime trade. One of the largest navies was constructed. The army was built up to staggering proportions. The German officer was the idol of the nation, the personification of German ambition. In German colleges, the sport of German youth was not football, but the deadly duel. The scar was the badge of honor. The more scars, the handsomer. Did they not prove the man's prowess in arms? And contentedly watching all stood the great general staff, still directed by the Prussian Junkers. 
secure in the knowledge that their power and authority was indisputable. Germany was geared for war. All it needed was a new leader to give the word. And again, that leader was at hand. William II of Hohenzollern, the Kaiser that your father knew. Not a shrewd, clever cynic like Bismarck, but a vain and arrogant braggart, yet a leader in the German tradition. We Germans like to bear arms, and we like the game of war. I shall enlarge your borders. And what did Karl Schmidt's father say to all this? A German spark has always ignited the fire. Soon everything will be aflame. Through one international crisis after the other, the Kaiser rattled his sword loudly demanding Germany's place in the sun. In vain, the other powers proposed an international agreement for general disarmament. But disarmament didn't suit the plans of the German militarists, landowners, state officials, or industrialists. They wanted their own way, and their own way meant war. War, therefore, was inevitable. It only needed an incident. How did this second generation Carl Schmidt react to the prospect of a world war? Berlin took on the air of a carnival. Blindly, joyfully, the people cheered the Kaiser, eager to follow a leader on the renewed march to conquest. Thus, in August of 1914, Carl Schmidt of the II generation, indoctrinated with 150 years of Prussian tradition, marched off to set the world aflame. Had he not been taught, did he not believe that whatever Germany demands is right? Even when he marched through Belgium, dismissing a solemn neutrality pact as a scrap of paper. Even when German scientists developed poison gases in violation of international agreements which Germany had solemnly...